Well, I was invited uh, to talk about the Pyramid Project, an experiment to search for hidden chambers in the second pyramid of Giza in Egypt that Louis first conceptualized in 1965. While the Great Pyramid is known to have a complex inner structure of large rooms in galleries, that's the Great Pyramid on the left side and the second pyramid on the right side. The second pyramid is very identifiable by the cap at the top of remaining casing stones. And if you look at the interior structure, on the left you see a diagram showing the interior structure of the Great Pyramid. And on the second, on the right, the second pyramid, which has apparently no rooms or chambers at all. And the question was, were there any rooms or galleries or tunnels in the second pyramid? Louis' basic idea was to use the naturally occurring cosmic rays, nearly all of which are muons, which have sufficient energy to penetrate through the pyramid and be captured by our detector, which were set in the underground chamber under the second pyramid. Now, I'm not going to drag you through all the details of the experiment that we did, which is well known to many of you. But should you be interested in those details, a wonderful account of them has been published by Charles Wohl in the American Journal of Physics. And in fact, I think what I will do is just tell you some stories and about our adventures during the work. So let me take you back to 1966. Egypt is a socialist country run by a military strongman named Gamal Abdel Nasser, who seized power in a coup in 1956. A country pretty firmly in the orbit of the socialist nations of the Soviet Russian. Nevertheless, there was a lot of interactions with U.S. companies, and many major U.S. companies had offices in Cairo, and Americans were generally well-liked in Egypt. As part of the project, Louis persuaded IBM to donate a small scientific computer, which was to be housed in the Ayn Shams University at Cairo. It was to be the first computer at any university in Egypt. The Egyptian physicists on the project viewed it as a major accomplishment. Now, the fact is that Louis was strongly insistent on having an international cooperative project and wished nothing more than to abolish the ugly American stigma, a phrase popular at the time. He worked hard to make the Egyptian physicists full partners in the experiment, even to the extent of bringing them over to Berkeley while the detection equipment was being constructed. Louis saw this effort as a collaborative experiment, exactly as we would have done an experiment at the Bevatron or at CERN. We do not usually think of Louis as a diplomat. In fact, <laughs> I would expect nearly everyone in the room would agree with that. <laughs> but in fact, in the last unpublished chapter of his autobiography, Adventures of a Physicist, Louis refers to himself as that feisty and competitive Alvarez. So he thought the same. <laughs> Not exactly the credentials of an accomplished diplomat or even having the temperament for one. But in this instance, he was superb. And as the story unfolded, he was helped greatly by his foresight in bringing in the Egyptian physicist as equal partners. This was not the norm in archeology. span It was the norm in physics, and Louis brought that to the, to the party. The project was very well received in Cairo, both in the press and by the government officials. Um, Louis was hailed as the great American scientist Louis Alvarez, which was interesting because he didn't have a Nobel Prize at the time. I've always described that uh, he hadn't worked with Rich long enough to get <laughs> 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 the, um, the government uh, in Egypt covered the salaries of the Egyptian members working on the project, and also they built the computer center for the donated machine. Additionally, during our first trip to Cairo for the organizational meeting, the government and the Antiquities Department laid on a large itinerary of archaeological site visits and tours, in addition to many meet and greets with important members of the Egyptian educational and scientific circles. With this first meeting, Louis was accompanied by Jan on the trip, and he also invited his son Walt and Walt's new wife, Millie. 
I arrived uh, several days in advance of the Alvarez party, so it became my job to prepare the way and make sure all the arrangements were correct. Uh, of course, during the war, Louis had traveled with many senior military brass, all of whom had their lieutenants and drivers and aide-de-camps running around and taking care of things. And I think it amused him to see me running around and making sure there were enough cars and that the accommodations were correct and that all the appropriate bellmen and cab drivers got a tip. But I enjoyed this role and traveling with the Alvarez family was a lot of fun. Not only did we visit the pyramids at Giza, but those also at Dashur and Saqqara, and an airplane trip to Aswan, where the high dam was under construction. Louis immediately recognized the airliner as a Russian built by Antonov and was a copy of the American Fairchild F-27. Of course, no one else had the faintest idea what the airplane was, but I checked later and Louis was correct. <laughs> Saqqara, south of Cairo, is a large old kingdom necropolis in the desert, perhaps 30 or 40 miles away from Cairo, and home of some of the very earliest pyramids. And the Egyptian archeologist had discovered an undisturbed old kingdom mummy buried there, and they wanted us to see it because it was the first one ever found undisturbed in the old kingdom. That's 5,000 years ago. We knew it would be in the desert, so we wore rough clothes, and we were prepared for the inevitable clambering around down an excavation. The day was hot. We were sweating. We spent a long time at the site, and not unusually in Egypt, ran into many delays. So we were very late leaving to start back for Cairo, where we were to attend a fancy reception and dinner in Louis' honor. We had attended to return back to the hotel to clean up and dress for dinner, but soon became trapped in the vicious Cairo traffic, so we got later and later. I thought we should go to the hotel and call and say that we were on our way, but would be quite late. However, Louis wanted to go directly to the event, which had already started. When we arrived in front of the event in our dirty desert clothes, I said to Louis, Louis, we can't go in there, we stink. <laughs> he replied laughing, don't worry, Jerry, only really important people can do things like this. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, Jan took his arm, and if they had been dressed in evening finery, made an impressive entrance, followed by the rest of us, and of course, the Alvarez completely charmed everyone at the dinner. The evening was a great success, and no one mentioned our dirty clothes. <laughs> so in the spring of 1967, I returned to Cairo with our whole team. We discovered that our first job was to build a laboratory. The data was recorded on magnetic tape, but in 1967, the only computer tape drives available were IBM drives about the size of a refrigerator and definitely would not fit inside the pyramid. So our detectors were attached by a very long cable through the pyramid tunnel and across the desert to a small two-room abandoned building which we converted into a laboratory. This conversion work actually took quite a while and it was an interesting sight to see Berkeley electronic engineers who normally would be occupied with designing microcircuits up on poles stringing power lines. So we pretty much started with a green field, very much unlike the large accelerators with their elaborate facilities to which we were normally accustomed. <clears throat> Shortly after the data taking had begun, the experiment was suspended and all of the personnel evacuated due to the Arab-Israeli War in June of 1967, the so-called Six-Day War. Along with all the other American government personnel in Cairo, we were moved first to Alexandria then to Athens, Greece, and finally back to Berkeley. The war didn't last long, but things were in a great uproar. The U.S. no longer had diplomatic relations with Egypt, and it wasn't clear just how popular Americans would be in Cairo. Louis faced a considerable challenge to get the experiment restarted. This required Louis to be at his very diplomatic best, and he did an excellent job of it under trying circumstances. In this, he was greatly assisted by heroic contributions and I do mean heroic contributions, from Lauren Yazzolino, who is here, and who returned to Cairo working with the Egyptians to complete the data acquisition, and by Jerry Lynch, who performed the data analysis at Lawrence Berkeley. The result was that the pyramid is solid in all directions surveyed. No spaces or voids were located. 
The result was published in the journal Science in 1969. Now I want to turn and talk for just a minute or two about how the pyramids were built. Louis was originally thinking about how the pyramids were built when he became interested in the internal structure of the second pyramid. He had some very definite ideas on the subject, and though he never wrote them up in any way, we had many conversations about how it was done. The question has occupied thinkers for centuries, but prior to 1965, almost all of the theories of construction came from archaeologists and not from engineers. You probably saw images in grade school books with blocks being dragged up giant sand ramps. This is because in the remains of such ramps have actually been discovered at some very small pyramids. Louis discounted the theory of ramps for large pyramids as do most modern engineering investors, investigators because it's easy to show that the volume of such ramps is larger than, or at least comparable to, the volume of the pyramid, and thus more energy must be expended building the ramps than the pyramid itself. And also for another reason, Louis used an interesting metric that he called the block current. And I'm going to show you what the block current that work. It's estimated that there are 2.3 million blocks in the pyramid. And that it took about 20 years to build a pyramid. Now all the physicists in the room know how many seconds there are in a year. They're pi 10 million. That's another Alvarez trick. When you want to remember numbers for estimating, you remember threes and tens. That's, those are the numbers you need to remember. And the number of seconds in a year is very close to pi. So 3.1 times 10 to the seventh or 31 times 10 to the sixth. Seconds per year. So this is 620 divided by 2.3 gives us 270 seconds per block, which is about four and a half minutes. If you work for 20 years, 24 hours a day straight, moving blocks. Imagine if you're standing at a long sand ramp, the blocks are going by you one every four minutes for 20 years nonstop. And if you figure, and we do, that they couldn't work at night, and they had to take a little time off to eat and go to the bathroom, then this comes down to about two minutes. So for 20 years, the blocks go by one every two minutes. Louis knew that was impossible. <clears throat> so being Louis, he figured out another way, a simpler way. You just get a lot of people and a lot of rope and you drag the block straight up the side. If you do it this way, you can use all four sides of the pyramid simultaneously. And you can have as many as perhaps 30 or 40 ropes and blocks going up the pyramid. And the only question might be, how heavy are the blocks? Well, they weigh about 4,000, maybe 5,000 pounds a piece. Sounds like a lot, but if you get 100 people, it's only 40, 50 pounds a person. And uh, most of the work in building a pyramid is at the bottom, not at the top. Because halfway up, you have three quarters of the volume below you. Since 1965, there have been a surprising number of books written about how the Great Pyramid was built. Various construction engineering specialists have produced more than a dozen or so books on the subject, mostly using almost every conceivable type of ramp, all failing to satisfy the block current criterion. I have examined some of these books, and in my view, Louis has another one right. 
We'll probably never be able to prove how the job was done, but I'm ready to mark up another one for Louis. <laughs> he was a great teacher and a great mentor to me personally, and it was a pleasure and an honor to be able to work with such an amazing man. Thank you.